Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen speaking. I want to address um, two myths that are uh, taught in the three principles community. Um, one of the myths is that our nature is exclusively, mark out that word, exclusively one of peace, happiness, and love. And also the myth that you need to believe in to believe in the first myth. And that is the myth that there is this thinker in there that has free will and that's using its capacity for free will to create a lot of suffering, which essentially is what you have to do to believe in the notion that we have this perfect mental health, that, that we essentially are perfect at our core, but simultaneously, when you look at the human condition, you see a lot of suffering, you see a lot of hatred, you see a lot of greed, you see a lot of fear, you see a lot of psychological symptoms, you see a lot of violence. How could this be? How could we be perfect at our core and have perfect mental health and have our nature be one of love exclusively? And then as a species, go around acting the way we do and treating each other the way we do. And the way the three principles community uh, makes this happen is by inventing this thinker that engages in so-called personal thinking, which has free will and uses its free will to kind of screw things up. And I think I, I think these notions are worth challenging. Now, first of all, there is an element of truth to this, meaning that when thinking slows, when there isn't rumination, when there isn't any noise in the system, so to speak, there is an inherent peace. There is an inherent clarity, so to speak. This is true. Now, if, if you have flow experiences or, or you meditate, you can, you can have the experience of thinking in the way it's conventionally understood reduce so markedly or drop away so much that that there's just this experience of oneness that there's no experiencer there's just the experience and and there is an inherent completeness in in that experience so this is true this is true. And by understanding the illusory nature of our experience and by understanding that our experience is essentially thought generated, that will result in us doing a lot less ruminative thinking and we will have a lot more access to that peace that is you know, behind the noise, so to speak. Not quite accurate as a metaphor, but, but behind the noise. So, this is true, but is it then true to say that this is our nature exclusively? Or is it true to begin to make claims about cosmology and say that, look, uh, the universe is one of love, or that there is this loving energy that is the source of all living systems and all creation? Is this really true? Probably not. I mean, I don't know anything about cosmology, but, but probably not, because if there is this loving energy that is the source of all of creation, then how do you account for the Black Plague? How do you account for AIDS? How do you account for the Holocaust? How do you account for uh, uh, pedophiles who, in sadistic ways, with no conscience, abuse kids? I'm not saying that all pedophiles do that. I, I'm saying, how do you account for 
you know, the torture and, and raping of killing, for example. You can't. You you have to. You have to then acknowledge that that the oneness behind all life is the source of the Holocaust, is the source of the Black Plague. Um, now, in, in, in terms of our subjective experiences, you, you, you can say that every thought, every feeling, every experience that you have comes out of nothing, so to speak. That is accurate, but if you're going to propose this split, this separation between our alleged true nature and all the crazy thinking that, that can often appear, then you have to propose a separation that isn't really there. You, you, you would have to make the mistake that the philosopher Jean Jacques Rousseau made when when he said that look human beings are born free we're free we're just corrupted by the institutions of society the culture by private ownership these things but but, but if you look at it carefully you know that doesn't add up it's it's too one side it's too one sided because if our nature is one of freedom and you acknowledge that the human beings generate the culture, so to speak, then where could the unfreedom or the corruption come from? It has to say something about the nature of the human beings. It's, it's a bit like, uh, I, I went to this master class in cold reading back in 2010 with this guy called Ian Rowland, who was really, really good in conning people into thinking that he had psychic powers. Now, he, he was an honest fraud in, in that sense, in that he was completely straight up about not having these psychic powers. He was just really good at, you know, kind of evoking the illusion, the illusionary experience in people that, that he could actually read his mind. And what he had, and I'm, I'm not going to share his system here, obviously, but he had this verbal system that he used where no matter what someone would say, he had this answer where he got to be right. So if, if Ian said, for example, you, uh, the person you're thinking of, you know, is, is a woman, if the other person says, yes, it's a woman, ah, you're a psychic, you, you have a hit. If the person says, no, it's not, then Ian could say, well, I, I, I don't mean woman in terms of gender. I mean that this person has many of the qualities that we associate with the feminine. Now, if that's true, then it's still a hit. Or if that's not even true, you, you could even change the criteria and say that, that this person uh, has evoked in you an appreciation of the feminine or an awareness that you need to, to develop those aspects of yourself, for example. So you just keep changing the criteria in such a, in such a way that you get to be right, no matter what type of response that, that you get. Now, so this illusion that you have to create to maintain the fiction that that our nature is exclusively one of love, peace, and happiness, is that you, you have to create this, this myth of this thinker that falls for illusions, that falls for the so-called outside-in illusion, and that also has free will, and is using that gift of free will to engage in thinking that leads to a kind of crappy experience. But um, this is a myth. If, if you look at, let's look at this from two angles, and I, I'd really recommend that you read the book Free Will by Sam Harris uh, for the neuroscience perspective on this. Since the days of Benjamin LeBay in 1983, there's been so many experiments that completely debunk the idea of free will. 
there's you know if you look at neuroscience there's there's no command and control center in the brain there's there, there's no place where a self resides that is the initiator of thoughts and feelings and actions and which everything revolves around uh, the the neuroscience clearly shows in more and more sophisticated ways that even when we often think that we're making a decision our unconscious brains has already decided so a lot of the time when we still think that we're in decision mode the, the, the brains decided and it's just hasn't reached conscious awareness yet now some of you may object and say oh no but that's not how I define free will you know well free will just means not being attached to anything in the outside world or you can you can but 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 if you really look at it if you look at our religions which Sydney banks and many 3p teachers like to point to as sources of wisdom you know the great religions where you can find wisdom they talk about free will that we have the free will to choose and that we're even going to you know the entire morality and ethics is based upon this idea of this autonomous thinker uh, actor who who exercises free will who chooses between good and evil and who will be judged you know and end up in paradise or, or end up in hell based upon how this free will has been exercised but what if there is no free will what if there is no free will what does that say about those ethical notions um, so if, if you look at our legal systems and if you look at the the, the religions the, they're essentially you know the the, the the notions of free will are, are based upon two ideas a you're the conscious source of your thoughts and, and actions and b that at any time you could have done differently so you did a but you had the free will to do differently now both of these notions are flawed and i recommend looking into that book free will by sam harris because it, it just does such a masterful job in in picking the whole concept apart now if you look at it more subjectively if if you really meditate on your experience you'll you'll notice that th there's always two things happening simultaneously there is an object in awareness and there's a knowing so for example if if you're seeing something or, or if you're hearing something or if you're feeling something or smelling something you know there, there's an object there, there's a perception and there's a knowing of that object and these two arise simultaneously so there's a knowing and an object arising simultaneously again and again and again and again and again this is essentially our experience but none of the objects that arise in consciousness belongs to anyone meaning that there isn't really an i or a thinker that is the initiator of these objects and and who these objects revolve around this is a myth if you if you really look at your experience one thing you could do for example is that you could you could meditate on sounds do this for 30 minutes for example and notice that you can hear sounds now these are also thought constructs they're, they're generated by the brain so to speak but but anyways listen for the sounds and you'll notice that there's hearing there's there's hearing going on constantly there's there's the object the sound the thought construct and there's the knowing of it and these two happen simultaneously but if you start to look for the listener or the hearer of sounds you'll never find one so there's hearing 
but there's no hearer. There's listening, but there's no listener. Now, this is extremely fascinating. That, then you can meditate on sight. And of course, again, the colors that you see aren't really there in the world. You know, the, these are also the principle of thought taking form. It's a thought construct. But, but, but if, if you meditate on sight, you'll notice that they're seeing, that there's objects in consciousness and there's the knowing of it and that these two happen simultaneously. So they're seeing, but if you look for the seer, if you look for the one who's seeing, you'll never find it. You can do exactly the same thing with, with thinking in conventional terms. You can watch the, the thought stream kind of emerge and you'll notice that there's thinking that arises and dissipates, that arises and dissipates. There's the thinking and the knowing appearing simultaneously time and time again. There's, there's a knowing of these thoughts. But if you look for the thinker of these thoughts, you'll never find one. What you'll find is that any notion of a thinker is just another thought. So these I thoughts, so what you'll notice is that thought itself is the thinker. There, there is no thinker behind the thoughts. There's just the next thought and the next thought and the next thought. It's just a simultaneous knowing thinking thing that's happening in consciousness moment by moment. But there's no thinker behind it to be found anywhere. So th th there's no free will in, in the sense of you being the author of your experience, of you being the experiencer, of you being the seer, the hearer, the thinker, the decider, the chooser. That's completely illusory. And if you meditate, what you'll notice is that at the moment of seeing, at the moment of hearing, there's no I. There's just seeing. There's just hearing. But then between these, between objects, so to speak, from time to time, this I thought will appear. But this is an afterthought. So for example, if you listen to the sounds, and right now I can hear a car driving by, you know, at that moment, if, if I then look for the listener, the thinking process might generate some sort of sentence that says, yeah, I'm listening, or I might get a feeling of being located somewhere in the head this is me, but, but notice that this is just another thought appearing in consciousness, and it wasn't actually there at the time of the hearing. So what you'll notice is that any I thought is an ad hoc add-on. It's, it's an afterthought. It was not actually there during the experience. So, so Let's say that you look back on a flow state or a wonderful performance and you feel pride. Now, this I thought that says, I did it, I made it happen, is an afterthought. It was not actually there during the flow state. In the same way, if you look back at some past event where you behaved badly or said something you wished that you didn't, and you start feeling a lot of regret and a lot of shame around it, the I that appears right now that takes ownership of that and says, I did that, I initiated that, that I thought was not there during the actual experience. It's just an afterthought that kind of looks back and draws this invisible line between itself and all these other I thoughts between various experiences, which then gives the illusion that th there was this permanent stable I that has been there the entire time. But this is completely illusory. So, so this is one reason why there is no free will, so to speak, because there, there, there is no one there to have it. Now, 
some people will then say, well, yeah, yeah, so I am the consciousness. I am the witnessing consciousness behind the experience. But there's no I to be found in consciousness either. I mean, look for it. I mean, right now, you know, look for consciousness. You, you can notice that the lights are on, but you can't really find consciousness as an object. You know, there's no form or shape or color. There's no I attached to it either. There's, there's just experience. There's just experience moment by moment by moment. So it's, it's, it's kind of an illusion that you have this observer, this consciousness that you are, and, and then you have these objects. Yeah, it's true that you're not identical with any of the objects. The, the objects that appear in consciousness are distinct, but they're not separate. So the objects that appear are distinct, but they're not, they're not separate. And you can run this experience. Try to find the dividing line between consciousness and any thought or feeling that appears. You'll notice that you can't really find one. You'll notice that, yes, the... The, the thought or the feeling is appearing in consciousness in a distinct way, but it's not separate from that same consciousness. And there really is no I in that consciousness either. So that also has to mean that, that if there is such a thing as a source of old experience, which I'm agnostic about, I, I'm just going to talk about subjective experience that everything just appears out of nothing and none of the things that appear belong to anyone meaning anger angers you know fear fears it's just a flavor it's just a quality it it, it doesn't really have an eye attached to it at the level of experience but but this also has to mean that that the i thoughts and the illusion of there being such a thing as a stable and separate self is distinct from consciousness but not separate from it not separate from it so to to, to get this dichotomy where on the one hand our nature is perfect, but, but on the other hand there's all this suffering, a lot of people attempt to create this, this separation between the, the form and the formless, but, but these can't be separate either. I mean, if, if you look for your mind, I mean, try it. If you look for your mind, you'll never find it. It's unfindable. You know, you, you, you can't really see it, but, but in that not seeing, you can experience the, 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 the deeper meaning of it, which is one of impermanence. It is one, it is, and it is fundamentally empty. So, there, there you go with that. So, um, I... I think for the three principles world, it, it, it would be a lot better to acknowledge this. And of course, here's the thing, by, by gaining a deeper appreciation, a deeper understanding of the nature of thought, and by engaging in meditation where you look for the self, only to find that it's not really there. You, you, you weaken those identifications. You end up with a lot less self-referential thinking. And then you end up with a lot less suffering. And then you end up with, you know, living from peace of mind way much more of the time as a realized experience. This is very possible. But it's it's not a good idea to you to, to use this 
and begin to make claims such as our nature is exclusively one of love and peace or or to begin to make claims about cosmology and saying that that the, the universe or, or the source of creation is, is, is one of, of exclusively uh, being, being love. There, there, there's also in, in Buddhist uh, texts this, this notion about the middle way, and, and the middle way can be conceptualized in many, many ways. But one way I think that's very good to kind of attempt to stay sane on this is, is if I ask you, for example, let's say that you're married and I ask you, does your husband exist or does your wife exist or does, does your kid exist if, if they actually exist? Yes, they do. I mean, they're not mythological. They exist. You, you, you can take their DNA. You, you, you can take pictures of them. You can, you can spend time with them. You know, they exist. So on the one hand, you know, separate beings, individuals, uh, objects, these processes exist for all practical purposes. You have to pay your bills, you, you have to deal with people. It, it exists. And it's not about and at the same time, at the level of experience, there's no wife or son or daughter separate from the thinking process in the same way that there's no I separate from the thinking process. So you, you, you can balance both. Like for example, my wife exists and at the level of experience, which ultimately is consciousness and its contents, there's no wife separate from the thinking process and, and there's no I separate from that thinking process. So I, I hope this has given you something to, uh, to contemplate um, a little bit. And again, you know, the, the reason, well, the reason, presupposing a cause and effect relationship that isn't, isn't really there, and perhaps a, a level of self-insight that none of us really has. So this is the story. This is how it looks. Uh, I care about the three principles teachings. I think... It has something unique to offer, not in, not in terms of principles, but when I look at other direct path teachings that point to these spiritual truths, the strength of the three principles is its emphasis on thought as the source of experience. That's what makes the three principles different. And that is in my clinical work with clients every day, you know, helping them to discover that their experience is thought generated. That really, really is the gold. But, you know, I, I, I like to say that, you know, if, if we're going to point people to alleged truths about the formless, it can't be based upon a pack of lies in the world of form. So... Again, the, the fact that you can realize that there's no such thing as a self that's permanent and stable, and that you can have experiences of, of oneness, for example, to various extents, to various degrees, um, does, does not really give you a basis to say that this proves that the universe is, is made up of love or that it proves the existence of God, or anything like that. I think the, the three principles community would, would do itself a huge service if it could get out of the religion business, if it could differentiate between uh, spirituality and, and religion. I, I think religion, for the most part, it's really organized stupidity, you know, in forms of social control. Yes, there are benefits. But, but as far as I can see, there's no benefit to religion that, that, that can't be had in even better ways in, in other ways. You know, the, the, if you're going to point to the formless, again, to base it on a pack of lies, you know, to, to as Sidney Banks said, you know, go to your church, go to your mosque. You don't have to, 
you don't have to endorse books that are essentially wife-beating manuals and are full of ideas of kid killing the infidels and the Jews and that a, a apostates should be put to death and that kids should be killed for disobeying their parents and you know there, there there's no there's no reason to be doing this. You, you can have deep spiritual insights and experiences without referring to that barbaric nonsense whatsoever. You know, it's, it's uh, in my view, it's a mistake. And in the same way, you know, there, there's no reason to, um, as I talked about in a previous video, there, there's no reason to... Uh, spread these blank slate ideas about childhood and and to promote the noble savage or or in psychological realms you know to talk about free will there's no reason really to 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 do these things to to say that yeah we're going to do that in kind of a contradictory way to point to these formless truths there's no real reason to 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 do so so this is going to probably provocative you know provoke quite a few people but but then again it's just your thinking so till next time